welcome to the keynote podcast from Kingdom Faith. Today's message is by Pastor Colin Urquhart. Now, God calls us to be a people of faith. We've seen uh, last week that we are to find out what pleases the Lord. That's what the scripture says. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. So we know that what pleases the Lord is that we live a life of faith. That's a life of trust in him. Now, you can use this word faith in many different ways. There are certain things we believe about God, that he is the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We can believe about doctrine, about the doctrine of salvation, and so on, and so on, and so on. But when Jesus uses this faith in relation to the disciples, he is talking about what I call a living faith, a faith to live by. Not just what we believe about God, not just believing that his word is true, but how we operate every day of our lives in faith. Trusting God, trusting his word, believing his promises, praying with faith, speaking with faith, and to a certain extent, of course, we've already been doing that in the, in, the, in the first few days of this term. Everything that has been said and, and, and is done really is to encourage your faith. But now we've got to be a little bit more explicit about this life of faith, this walk of faith. And... Jesus, in his relationship with the disciples, wanted to make them people of faith and people of love. And Paul says the, the uh, only thing that matters is faith working through love. He also says faith without love is empty. It's like a clashing gong or cymbal. Um, so it's not that we are talking about faith without love, but... We can only talk about one thing at a time. Uh, Jesus never preached a balanced message. If you look at what he preached at different times, uh, he was preaching about particular things. And where you get the balance from is putting all that he said together. And, you know, sometimes uh, preachers go backwards, fall over backwards, trying to be... Uh, trying to say everything all in once and end up by saying nothing uh, of any real strength and power because we need to concentrate on one thing but realize that it's related to other things. So we're going to just talk about the faith. We're going to concentrate on the faith (coughs) this morning. We talked about love quite a bit last week. So let's see what Jesus says about faith. And, of course, often that is linked with prayer. So we know in Matthew 7, 7, Jesus said, the truth version brings out the meaning of the Greek, continue to ask and you will pray, and what you pray for will be given you. Go on seeking and you will find what you're looking for, Keep knocking, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who continues to ask receives. He who goes on seeking finds. The door will be opened to the one who keeps knocking. In other words, when you are operating by faith, there's a determination. You are not going to give up. You know the objective. You know what you're aiming for. And you're not going to accept anything less than what you're aiming for. Hello. So, uh, you know, when Jesus, if if you translate the words of Jesus, ask and you will receive, seek and you will find, it sounds like a bit of advice. But actually Jesus is saying something much stronger than that. He says, go on asking and you will receive. And everyone who goes on asking receives. Go on seeking and you will find, for everyone who goes on seeking will find. Go on knocking, because all those who go on knocking, to them the door will be open. 
And you see, there are a lot of people who think that what they are saying and doing when they pray and in the attitude that they have is faith, but they don't persevere. And if they don't persevere, then it wasn't faith. Hello? We can, we can sort of say things that we know are right to God in prayer, but if we're really operating by faith, there is this determination, there's this perseverance, We've, we set our focus on the objective, and we are determined to reach that objective. Right. Now, of course, it needs to be the right objective, and this is where we learn that faith is a response to the initiative that God takes. You know, the Holy Spirit always wants us to walk by faith. And faith comes from hearing the word. So the Holy Spirit will always give us the words of revelation that will spark faith in us, create that faith, cause faith to rise up within us, so that then we can exercise that faith in the way that the Holy Spirit is leading us to do in that particular situation. Are we there? So there's a big difference between what we would like to happen and what we really believe will happen. Healing is always a good example. Uh, everybody would like to be healed, but the question is, do we believe that we have received the healing? We'll, we'll come to that in, in, in a little while. And are we therefore persevering in thanksgiving until we see the healing fully manifested. You see, if we think, well, you know, let's have prayer, let's have a laying on of hands, and if it happens, it happens, if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen, and we just have to accept that. No, 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 no. The, the laying on of hands or anointing needs to be done within the context of faith, that we have set our eyes upon the objective and this prayer, this laying on of hands, this anointing, whatever, this is part of seeing that objective fulfilled. But we're not dependent upon what God does in a moment of time when somebody prays with us. We are dependent upon believing and trusting in the Word of God, in the promises of God, in what He has already accomplished on the cross. Are we there? Now, <clears throat> Jesus talks about seed when uh, he is teaching the disciples about faith. Uh, he says, Most emphatically, I tell you the truth, if you had true faith that was even the size of a minute mustard seed, you would be able to say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible for you. This kind of deliverance takes place when you pray with faith. Now, if any of you have been to Switzerland or a mountainous area, uh, Switzerland's a good example because the mountains are right on top of you there, or you're right on top of the mountains, but you can stand at the foot of this mountain and it looks totally and completely immovable. But if you get up in an aeroplane and you fly over those same mountains and you look out of the window, those same mountains are smaller than the size of your little fingernail. And if you could, you know, you feel you could reach out of the window uh, of the plane and just <laughs> flick that little mountain aside. It's the same mountain it's just that from the plane, you get a different perspective. And this is what faith is all about. Faith doesn't look at the mountain. Faith doesn't talk about the mountain. Faith doesn't describe the mountain. Faith doesn't tell everybody else that you're sorry you've got this mountain. <laughs> faith gets airborne and looks at things from God's perspective you don't look up at your problem, you look down on your problem, 
because you're seated in heavenly places, which is even higher than the aeroplane. So the mountain is even smaller than what you see out of an aeroplane. And you know that mountain has to move. Now, Jesus says, all you need to accomplish that is faith the size of a mustard seed. That's a mustard seed from the hills by the Sea of Galilee. You can't even see it, can you? But it's there. So Jesus is saying, that's how much faith you need to move that mountain. That's all you need. You don't need great faith. You don't need large amounts of faith. You just need a tiny little bit of faith the size of that seed. <coughs> That's the example he gives. Uh, in Luke's Gospel, he says, <clears throat> if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this sycamore tree, be uprooted and moved and planted in the sea, and it will move. Have you ever seen a tree planted in the sea? But you see, faith, that size, can cause things to happen that are impossible in the natural. You can't move mountains in the natural. Nobody is going to move one of the mountains in... Switzerland, they might tunnel through the mountain, but they're not going to move it. And you're not going to see people putting sycamore trees in the sea. But Jesus is saying that's the power of faith. So we know nothing is impossible for God. But then Jesus said, all things are possible to he who has faith. So whether it's moving a mountain, whether it's moving the tree or whatever, if you have faith, nothing is impossible. Nothing. Now, it's one thing knowing that in your head. It's another thing believing in your heart that nothing is impossible for you. because you're a person of faith. So that would mean whatever God put before you, remembering that faith is a response to the initiative of God, whatever he puts before you, he makes possible. It is possible for you. Our problem, you see, is one of perspective. Even when we pray, there's a temptation to tell God about the problem yeah. rather than to actually speak to the problem and command it to move. Yeah. See, the interesting thing is that when Jesus teaches about prayer, he says it's not a matter simply of speaking to God, but of speaking to the problem. You know, people are often... <clears throat> come and ask me for prayer for healing and so on. Uh, and, you know, sometimes I, I say to them, have you ever spoken to the problem? <coughs> have you ever spoken to the sickness and commanded it to leave your body? And they look at you as if, you know, you've just flown in from Mars. You know, what on earth do you mean? Well, that's the way Jesus taught us to pray. That if you have faith... You therefore have authority. And if you have authority, you have authority over the situation about which you believe. Therefore, you are to exercise that authority. And if we don't pray with faith in the way that Jesus tells us, then uh, no wonder we don't see the results that we want to see or that the Scripture speaks of. We have to do things his way 
and then we get his results. If we've been praying in a certain way and we haven't had those results, that's a sh pretty sure indication we need to pray in a different way. So we get better results. <coughs> Any believers in the room? Yes. Okay. Now, seed, that, oh, I need my seed again. That seed which you have in your hand will not produce anything oh I've got two see they're so small it's difficult to get just one but those seeds will produce nothing while they're in my hand they have to be sown so what does the Lord teach us that you reap what you sow. So faith is something that has to be sown. <coughs> Pastor Clive, as you know, is a man of faith. He learned to be a person of faith when he was very, very small because when our children were young, we sat round the table every day as a family at the end of the meal, and uh, we read a book by a famous healing evangelist called Oral Roberts, and it, it was about what he terms as seed faith, showing how you have to sow in prayer in order to reap the harvest. And it was quite a thick book, which is in short sections, and we would go through this book day by day with our children. And it was simple enough for them to be able to understand, even when they were quite young. Uh, and when we finished the book, we would go back and start it again. Because it was so important to build into our children the principles of faith. And just to be round the table at the end of the meal in the evening, what well, was a time when we could be together, talk about these things, understand these things, then pray together, sowing our faith uh, with agreement as a family as to what God would do. So those of you that are bringing up families, that's a good example to follow. What your children will become then as children of faith. So the seed is no good, of no use, until it's sown. It contains the potential for tremendous life and growth. You remember in one of the parables about the kingdom, Jesus said it's like a mustard seed, which when it's planted becomes a tree that even the birds of the air come and nest in. So that tiny, tiny little seed that you can hardly see from where you are, I'm holding in my two fingers a potential tree. But it will never become a tree unless the seed is sown. And of course, in what Jesus teaches in the parable of the sower, it needs to be sown in good soil. Yes. Then it will produce the harvest, not shallow soil, not, <laughs> not weedy soil full of thorns and thistles, but in good soil. So your heart is good soil. You have a believing heart. Amen? God has been cleansing and purifying your heart last week. So you have a heart that is able to believe God, to trust God, to actually sow seeds. Now, of course, once, once the seed, you see, when you sow seed, you have the objective before you. You sow the type of seed according to the kind of plant you want. 
If you sow an apple seed, an apple pip, you don't expect to get an orange tree. And you won't be disappointed, you won't get an orange tree. But if you want an apple tree, you sow an apple seed. This is a bit too deep for some of you, but <laughs> just try to keep up with me. Uh, so, in other words, you have to sow the right kind of seed for the right objective. And that is the case when we pray. You see, when we sow the seed, we now water it and nurture it until it produces the objective. That's why Jesus said, you go on asking, you go on seeking, you go on knocking until you see the tree. Amen? Yes. What you don't do, once you've planted the seed, is dig it up to see how it's getting on. <laughs> I mean, that would ruin the whole growth process, wouldn't it? And sometimes, uh, when you plant a seed, you have to be patient at first because you don't see anything. <coughs> for a while you don't see anything then you see just the shoot and then the stem and then so on the, the whole plant develops but there's always that those moments if you like right at the beginning of the whole process when you can wonder in the natural is this, really, is this seed really going to produce the plant now, of course, if we are sowing with faith, then we have absolute confidence that whatever prayer we've sown will produce the right result. Yeah. Amen? So, Jesus puts it this way when he's teaching the disciples to pray. He said, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it. And then it will be yours. So, what, he, what does he mean? He means, well, when you sow the seed, believe that you've received the tree. Right. Hello? Yes. See, believe that what you have sown will produce the objective that you believe. Now, because we're dealing with supernatural things, that seed could become a tree overnight. There are times when the seed becomes the tree immediately. Right. But that's not always the case. In fact, compared with, with all the things about which we pray, that is not so often the case. Much more often, we have to persevere and be determined to hold on to our prayer of faith until we see the objective. Are we there? But it is necessary to sow the seed. And once sown, you don't re-sow it. You see, this is the point. Once you've asked, then how do you water it? Well, you water it with thanksgiving. Why? If you believe that you have received it, then you say thank you. Yes. When you receive something, uh, as a gift from someone, don't you say thank you? Yes. You show that you have received the gift and, and, uh, and that you are grateful for it. So you say thankful, thank you. So you keep watering the seed with thanksgiving until it comes to fulfillment. <coughs> now, how does this sowing of seed tie in with the um, speaking to mountains. If we speak to the mountains, aren't they supposed to move immediately? Yes, very often they do. But if they don't, what are you going to do? Well, <clears throat> you know, if a, if a child is playing up and is being naughty, you tell it not to do something. So, no, don't do that. Just remember that every child learns the meaning of the word no before they understand the meaning of the word yes. No is the first word that they learn to understand because there's that natural instinct 
to do what they shouldn't do. It's called the fallen nature. And children aren't very old before they demonstrate that they have a fallen nature. And they always want to do the thing. And they, they even do it in a defiant way, you know? Uh, they're, they're only sort of this high, and they know they're not supposed to go to that cupboard, and so they look at you defiantly before they open the cupboard. I mean, that's the fallen nature. Just shows that even your children will need to be saved. Hallelujah. <laughs> The trouble is that there are some big children of God that still do the same kind of thing. <laughs> they look defiantly at the Lord and then still they do what they want rather than what he wants. No students at Rofi, of course, but you have to remember, you have to remember that not everybody else is blessed by being a student at Rofi, and therefore blessed with your great spirituality. <laughs> Amen. Uh, you see what a person of faith I am? <laughs> See what good I'm speaking over your lives. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, uh, this means that we have this authority to say to a mountain, but if it doesn't move immediately, you don't say, oh, it's not going to move. But like a naughty child, if they don't respond first time, then you tell them again and more firmly. And if they still don't respond, you tell them again with even greater firmness. And that's when you have your threatening voice. And they have to learn that's the limit. If I go beyond that, I'm in real trouble when I hear the threatening voice. So <clears throat> anyway, this is not a seminar on bringing up children. Uh, but you see, sometimes you have to persist. And even in speaking to mountains, sometimes you have to persist. If the mountain doesn't move when you first speak to it, you don't give up. Right. You persist. Yes. You're determined. That jolly mountain shall be moved. It will be done for you. Right. It is not going to stay in your life. It is not going to, to mess up your life. It's not going to be a constant impediment to you. You have the authority to move it, so move it you will in the name of Jesus, that name that is above every other name. Amen? Now, we've been learning also the power of our words. So Jesus says to the Roman centurion, go, the healing will take place, this is the healing of his servant, in precisely the way you believed it would happen. Now that's interesting. Because you see, sometimes these mountains don't move immediately. Sometimes we don't see the immediate, immediate resolution of the situation we're praying for. Because actually, although we would like that, we don't really believe that. When people come and you know, ask me for prayers, I, I ask them questions like Jesus did, you see, because you have to get them to express their faith. You need to know where they are, whether they're in a position of faith to receive what it is they're asking for. Uh, and one of the questions I often ask them, I say, well, if I pray for you now, will God heal you now? Now, that's a very, very interesting question, you see. Because... The Roman centurion expected his servant to be healed immediately. Blind Bartimaeus expected his sight to be received immediately. The woman who pressed through the crowd to touch Jesus to be healed uh, of her flow of blood, she expected to be healed immediately. If only I touch him, I shall be healed. So as soon as she touched Jesus, power went out of him. Now, when you believe something, you know it. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Faith is being sure and certain. So, <clears throat> what I'm saying to someone is, are you sure and certain that when I pray for you now, God will heal you. 
If they say yes, which sometimes they do, you know you're on a winner. And that by the time you've prayed, you finish praying, the person will be healed. Uh, more often you get the kind of answer, well, I hope so. But hope isn't faith. Right. See, hope always relates to the future, not to the present. Right. So you actually know the person is not in the place of faith to receive the healing now. Are we there? Now, you don't judge and condemn someone for that. It's just that they don't have the revelation of faith yet. So the wise thing to do is to pray for them to get that revelation of faith, to believe that God will speak to them a word of faith that will then enable them to receive their healing. I could tell you many, many testimonies. I, uh, when, when I do your, your faith lectures, I'll tell you some testimonies of of how all these things have worked out, but there's, there's not time to go into all that this morning. Uh, but you, you actually can speak faith into a person's life under the anointing of the Spirit there and then. God can witness a faith to them so that people come from a place of hope to a place of faith, or even sometimes from a place of unbelief to a place of faith. Because faith comes from hearing the Lord, and so long as the Holy Spirit witnesses that word to them, they're going to come into an entirely different place of expectation. Uh huh. Now, of course, if the person you're praying for is to have that expectation, you as the one who's doing the praying also needs to have the same expectation. Hello? Now, you won't have the same expectation if you know the person isn't in the place of faith unless you have a clear word from God. But you can have the same expectation. This is what Jesus meant when he said, if two of you agree concerning anything on earth, it will be done by my Father in heaven. What's he mean? meaning? If the person you're praying for has got expectation and you've got the same expectation and you agree in that expectation, it will be done. So actually you can only pray together with someone else in faith, if you know what their expectation is. Right. You know, if we're told to, to pray together in couples and twos or threes, actually we shouldn't just start to pray. We should first of all talk to one another and say, well, what do you expect? What, what are the expectations? What do you believe will happen? Yeah, well, I can, I can agree with that. Sometimes, you know, we talk about the agreement of faith when we don't even know if we are in agreement because we don't know what each other's expectations are. Are we there? So it's, it's very, very important because <clears throat> if we're going to sow the prayer, we need to have the same expectation as to what we're going to reap as a result. Hello? You at the same meeting? I'm at the faith meeting. You at the faith meeting? Yes. Okay, good. So, <clears throat> uh, Jesus asked these questions to see where people's faith was, and he responded exactly to the faith that, uh, that they put in him. You see, to the Roman centurion, he said, you don't need to come into my house. Speak the word only, my servant will be healed. So Jesus just said, go, you, it will be done for you just as you have believed. When Jairus, the synagogue leader, comes because his daughter is dying and actually dies before Jesus gets to the house, he, he's got a different kind of faith. He says, come and lay your hand on her and she will live. You see, the centurion said, no, you don't need to come. So Jesus didn't. This was, well, but the, the Jairus' faith was, come and lay your hand on her. So mm -hmm. Jesus went with him to lay his hand on her. Now, and, and the woman, you see, if only... If only I touch him, I will be healed. So <coughs> Jesus wasn't even involved in the healing. He just went, Phew! Ooh, some power's gone out of me. And, and the, the, the disciples couldn't understand this because he was being jostled by the crowd. You know, there's a great crowd of people around. But Jesus knew he'd been touched by faith. Hallelujah. And every time Jesus is touched by faith, power goes out of him. Yes. You see? So it's done exactly the way you believe. 
So Jesus says to people on a number of occasions, doesn't he, as you believe, so let it be. It will be done to you according to your faith. And then he makes this extraordinary promise, you will believe whatever you ask in prayer if you believe. Amen? Now we saw when, when we were looking at the various ways in which the Holy Spirit operates in our lives, one evening last week we, we looked at this, didn't we? Uh, we saw that the uh, fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Actually, the Greek says faith rather than faithfulness. A fruit of the Spirit. And then when we read the, when we read the um, gifts of the Spirit, as they're usually called, the manifestations of the Spirit, we saw that one of those gifts or manifestations is faith. So it's a fruit of the Spirit, it's a gift of the Spirit, and Paul, when he's writing to the Corinthians in the second letter, he talks about the way faith operated, first with God, he spoke, and creation came into being. Let there be light. And there was light. Now, Jesus, uh, God was not surprised. You see, he spoke into being exactly what he had in mind. So then he looked at the outcome and he said, that's good. That's exactly what I intended. It's very interesting in the latest scientific research, they found that the power that is causing the universe to expand is light. It's not, you know, the energy is in the light. So the latest scientific discovery is proving that Genesis 1 was true, and we could have told them that <laughs> before they did all their research. But you see, God spoke it into being. Jesus spoke these healings into being. Get up and walk. Be open. Blind eyes open. Deaf ears open. And then Paul says this. With that same spirit of faith, we believe and therefore speak. Hello? Hello? So these mustard seeds that we sow, obviously they're not physical mustard seeds, like the ones in this container. In Scripture, your words are seeds. So when you sow in faith, you sow the word of faith. Let there be light. Let there be healing. Let this mountain be moved. See? With that same spirit of faith. <coughs> now, of course, God believed when he said there would be light, there would be light. Jesus believed when he said, get up and walk, that the man would get up and walk. So if you're operating that same spirit of faith, you believe what you sow what you say will produce the same results. Whether that's an instantaneous, immediate miracle, or whether it's one of those things that's going to happen through the perseverance, you keep watering that seed with thanksgiving until it produces the result, the desired result. Whichever way it is, you keep walking by faith. 
If any of you have read my book on faith called Anything You Ask, you'll know that I use this analogy of uh, some answers are like rockets. You pray and it's like a rocket coming into your life and boom, there's an explosion of God's power and it all happens. But other answers are like a tortoise. They seem to be creeping towards you, you know, and you have to be patient until the jolly thing arrives. The, the amazing thing is that just before the tortoise arrives, it becomes a rocket. Too deep for you. Never mind. Think, think about it. Pray over it and see if you get the revelation. Uh, the, the point is that God is faithful. And God would not be faithful if he did not answer every prayer of faith. So when he says, as you believe, so that it be, that's exactly as it is. It will be as you believe. It may, not, it may not happen immediately, it may be after a period of time, but it will happen. If you have the faith to believe that something is going to happen immediately, because that's really what the Holy Spirit has been witnessing to you, then it will be done to you immediately, or for the person you're, you're praying for. Uh, some of you have probably heard this before, but um, a, a good example of this, I, I, I was leading a mission somewhere and there was uh, a boy of uh, about 18 months getting on to two, some, some that sort of age. <coughs> um, and he was born with some uh, congenital eye problem and he was going completely blind. He was almost completely blind. And there was, there was no... Uh, medical cure for this. And because the mission evenings, the, the meetings used to go on quite a long time because of all the ministry and the healings that God was doing, the parents didn't want to bring this little boy because, you know, they get the restless long meeting of three hours or so. So <clears throat> they asked if they could bring the boy to see me at the place where I was staying. And... Uh, uh, I was staying in the house of one of the pastors that was organizing this mission. So uh, I said, yeah, yeah, that's fine. So before the boy and his parents were due to arrive, I was praying about the situation, and God simply said to me, very simply said to me, I, I'm going to heal him. He'll be healed completely. So the parents, Julia, arrive with the boy, and they're shown into the room. And, you know, I think, well, I better have some polite conversation. So I just started asking the, the um, parents, you know, how bad was it when he was born, and what exactly is the problem, and what is the prognosis, and is there no... And I, I sort of asked three or four of these questions, and I thought, this is stupid. God has said he's going to heal them. So they were halfway answering one of my questions. And I said, look, look just stop. I'm going to pray because God's going to heal your boy. Two minutes later, he was completely healed. And they, you know, they said, thank you very much. And they were gone. And they were gone in five minutes, perhaps, in our gone. And I said to the pastor, I hope they didn't think I was rude. Uh, because, you know, it all happened so quickly. And, and he said to me, look, they came to get their boy healed, and he was healed. They're not, they're not upset. They don't think you've been rude. They're just grateful that the boy's been healed. But you see, the lesson that, that, that God taught me by that, look, if you've got a word from me, don't fluff about. Get on with it. You don't have to be polite and do a whole lot of things. You've got my word, so just do it. I don't think Jesus, you know, said to blind Bartimaeus, oh, well, tell me all about it. Have you had any medical advice on this? And <laughs> what did the doctor say? And, you know, <laughs> he just healed him. Uh, and this is why it's so important for us to be listening people because faith comes from hearing, doesn't it? <clears throat> right? So God will speak to you and then, you know, you have faith. You know what is going to happen. You know what is going to happen. I mean, I, I didn't doubt that that boy was going to be healed because I had the word from God. He's going to be healed. That's it. Done deal. So it's, it's important, isn't it, that 
as we sow, we continue to listen. Right? We're sowing what God tells us to sow, but we're continuing to listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying. Because sometimes we don't sow in quite the right way. And, you know, God has to adjust what we're believing. Adjust our, our vision as to what to expect. But the Holy Spirit's good at that. You know, when we, when we don't get things right, he's good at helping us to adjust things so that we do get them right. Any believers? Okay. So, <clears throat> it's good fun, isn't it? To be a people of faith and to know that you can not only see God doing great things in your life as a result of that faith, but also you can be such a great blessing to others. But you see, it is important, especially when you're dealing with believers, that you make sure that they are in a place of faith so there's that agreement, if any two of you agree. When you're praying for non-believers, God doesn't expect a non-believer to believe. So actually it's often very much easier to heal non-believers because God will show, he will demonstrate the reality of his existence, of his love and of his life and of his power by doing a miracle in someone's life. Let me tell you from experience, even though some people receive a great miracle, they don't necessarily become believers. You would, think, you would think that they would, but they don't always, not immediately, but some do. But you see, the, the point is we don't want people to believe just in signs and wonders, because if people believe in signs and wonders and there's no signs and wonders for a period, then they've got no faith. Their faith needs to be in God, who is a God of signs and wonders, and who performs signs and wonders to confirm his word. Right. Very good. Right? You know, the, that's when we should really expect the Spirit of God to move after the word has been preached, faith has been raised in the hearts of people, and then God says, right, now I will confirm this word that I've spoken through the preacher by the signs and the wonders that will take place. That's why they're called signs. They're signs of the presence of the kingdom. So, you know, the normal thing is that we preach the kingdom and heal the sick in that order. When Jesus sent the 72 out, he said, heal and then preach. But that was in situations, you see, uh, that were evangelistic. So when you're out on the street, you can see somebody healed, and then you can tell them why they got healed. Uh-huh. Hello? Okay, so... I thought it would be quite neat this morning if we move some mountain. If we sowed some seed. Right? Now, we've seen that faith is a fruit of the Spirit. Faithfulness is keep living by faith trust in God. Uh, we've seen that it's a gift of the Holy Spirit, but we've seen also that it is the nature of the Spirit. With this same spirit of faith, we believe and therefore speak, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4. So, <clears throat> we're going to pray first for the spirit of faith to be released in us. Now, that actually brings about a great change in your life. I can, I can remember when I was first, first began to travel after I left Luton, and I was speaking at sort of big conferences and events. There was one time I was speaking at this big meeting in Sydney in Australia. 
And there, there were two of us that were the speakers at this event. The other was a, a man with a great reputation for faith. Um, he actually came from the States. Uh, and when, when I observed this, well, I listened to what this man was saying. Now, I just had five and a half years of revival in Luton. We'd seen people being healed every day and, and uh, you know, people coming to the Lord on a daily basis. I mean, it was a wonderful move of God. <coughs> So faith had been operating all through that time. But I saw in this man a quality of faith that was beyond anything I personally had myself. I just perceived that that man's got something I haven't got. And Lord, I want it. Now, I certainly didn't want his ministry. The way he ministered and the way he exercised that faith was, for me, a great big turn-off. I mean, I, th I was saying, Lord, uh, you know. But I could see the quality of faith. So I wanted that quality of faith, but I didn't want the style. You get me? I mean, the style was, for me, way out, way, way, way out. And, and, uh, but he was that kind of character. He was a way out character, this, this guy. And, and um, so <clears throat> I prayed. And I said, Lord, I want that quality of faith. I want you to, because this, this I realized now, this is the gift of faith. This is the spirit of faith. Yes, faith comes from hearing, and I'd heard something, and I'd seen something I didn't have, but I thought, I want, I want to move into that kind, that, that nature of faith, that quality of faith, that place of faith. I'm not, I'm not there. And as a result of that prayer, God did that. I won't tell you now, because there's, there's no time, but I actually went through a, a severe testing of my faith that night, but when I ministered the following day, I just knew that God had answered the prayer, that I was in a, a completely different place of faith and of expectation. There was a greater authority and a greater release of power. And it wasn't that I hadn't seen things happening before because I was used to seeing all these healings taking place. So, but, you see, this is the point. You don't, you can't, you can never have another person's ministry and you shouldn't want another person's ministry because that person's ministry is right for them but it won't be right for you. But sometimes you can see a quality in people that you don't have and you can say, Lord, that quality I need in my life. I need that gift of faith to be operating in my life. I need that spirit of faith. I don't want to just struggle to believe I want you to do something. I want you to impart something to me so that I have this seed faith. I believe that when I pray and when I sow those seeds of faith in obedience to your spirit, that I'm always going to see the tree. That when I speak to the mountain, it's always going to move. That I, I will have that determination to persevere in prayer and never give up. And you know, Jesus taught, it says in, in Luke's gospel, that Jesus taught the parable of the unjust judge to teach, and it's interesting that this is the way the scripture puts it, that Jesus taught that parable to teach people to always pray and never give up. It's either chapter 17 or 18, I can't remember now, verse 1. But it's at the beginning of one of those chapters uh, that we would always pray and not give up. So this morning we're going to pray for that spirit of faith, for that gift of faith. Amen? If that gift is already operating in you, pray for a fresh in, endowment of that faith, endowment of that faith. And as a result of that, you're going to sow seed. 
that what you're asking God to do this morning is to give you that seed faith that whatever you sow will produce the harvest. Right. Come on. Come on. Amen. Amen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give all of you some seed. Right? And we're going to pray over our lives, not just pray over the seed, but this seed that you have will be a constant reminder to you. So just keep it somewhere safe. Put it in some little thing. I mean, you just have a few seeds, each of you. But let it be a constant reminder. When you pray, you're praying with seed faith. You're sowing seeds that are going to produce the harvest. Did I hear an amen or amen. hallelujah or I believe it from anyone? So we're expecting an impartation now, yes, for God to work a new dynamic of faith in each one of us and therefore among us corporately. Anybody say amen? amen. Okay, so... <clears throat> Let's have the musicians forward for a moment. What we're going to do is stand and just praise the Lord. And uh, I want each of you to, there's plenty of boxes of tissues around, just have a, a tissue in your hand so that then a few of these seeds can be poured into your tissue and in that way you will be able to keep it. Keep the seed. You, don't keep it in the tissue. Transfer it into something else. That... Keep it in your room. People do all kinds of things. You know, you can even get a piece of cello tape and, and cello tape the seeds on the inside of the cover of your Bible. Right? You know, people do all kinds of things like that. Just as a constant reminder that, yes, I'm sowing seed and these seeds are going to produce a harvest. Thank you for listening to this Kingdom Faith podcast. We trust it's been an encouragement to you. For more information and resources by Kingdom Faith and for our other audio and video podcasts, please visit kingdomfaith.com.